Thank you, everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. And it's been, I'm, as, as Carol said, I'm enjoying this thoroughly and feel very honored to be a part of this symposium. Um, so uh, we've seen this image uh, many times already today, and we'll see it many more times. I'm going to focus just on those two tiny little bones <laughs> um, and, and what those bones of Lucy and those of other afarensis individuals can tell us about the evolution of hand dexterity and tool use. Um, so we'll start, um, as everyone else has, sort of with the, the state of play in 1974, uh, November 24th, um, and what we knew at that point. Um, this was actually, you know, it was a good year. I was born two weeks later, so obviously a very important year for paleoanthropology. <laughs> I'm also means I'm also turning 50, unfortunately. Um, but so we, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so you can see here with this remarkable skeleton um, that offered so much more uh, in novel information about um, homo early hominin morphology, about the evolution of bipedalism that we just heard so beautifully from Carol, and other insights that we'll hear about later today. She only has two um, bones of her hand, so uh, a finger bone or a proximal phalanx, and a capitate, or which is a, a central bone in your wrist. And we have 27 bones in each of our hands, so this might seem like uh, you know, not, not so much in terms of preservation. But in 1974, this was the extent of our, of, of our understanding of early hominin hand evolution. We had a few isolated elements from sites at, uh, at South, in South Africa. We had the OH7 hand of Homo habilis, which I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, and this scrappy little lunate from China. <laughs> and this was, this was really it in terms of early hominin evolution. So adding two bones to this was actually a significant increase in the sample size. And so in 1974, our understanding of early hominin evolution and, and tool use was really dominated by the discoveries that were made a decade earlier that we've, we've heard a little bit about already today um, at Olduvai or Olduvai Gorge. Um, so initially, Synthanthropus, or Nutcracker Man, was, was found on this living floor, as it was described, uh, next to tools that look like the, these ones here, so old one tools. And in 1959, Zinge was described as the first tool user. Then a year later, <laughs> that hand, together with uh, a lower jaw, a partial foot, and importantly, some cranial bones that showed that this individual had a bigger brain than that of Synthanthropus um, were discovered. And Louis Leakey and his team decided actually that this bigger brained individual was the tool maker instead of Zinge. And so this is what drove um, Louis Leakey, Philip Tobias, and, and, um, and Napier to to decide that this larger brained hominin was a tool maker instead. And that the naming this new species Homo habilis, or meaning, meaning handyman. And so importantly, the ability to make stone tools was used to help define this new species. And so our understanding of tool, be, uh, sort of tool behaviors in, at this time period was really, I think, founded on the fact that we knew a lot more about tools in more recent periods that were more complex, um, like those of, used by early humans and Neanderthals, and this idea that tool use required a big brain and, and amazing dexterity that humans have, and therefore it had to be a human feature. It had to be something that only um, humans and those directly on our line could, would be capable of doing. And therefore, you had to, you know, you, it was something called, uh, something that only Homo could do. And we knew at this time, a, a decade before, that Jane Goodall um, had shown us that chimpanzees could use tools, that they could take sticks and um, fish for termites um, or ants, but this was organic tool use. It wasn't stone tool use. And therefore, stone tool use, and particularly stone tool making, was something that was considered an exclusively human or homo, homo feature, and this is why OH7 was named Homo habilis and not Australopithecus habilis, as we would like to call it, Bernard, even though. <laughs> okay. So, coming back to Lucy, is that I think at the time no one was really uh, maybe thinking so much about her tool making abilities because she was 1.5 million years 
earlier than the earliest known tools at the time. But shortly after uh, Lucy's discovery, um, there were, as, as Carol pointed out, there were many new discoveries at, at the site of AL333, including many, many hand bones, which makes people like me who really like hands very excited. Um, and so these are two composite hands, um, meaning that these are hand bones from multiple individuals that are brought together to try and get a better idea of what um, the Afaransis hand might look like. These were pictured in, in Don's National Geographic article in 1976. Um, and this allows us to, tell, to say a little bit more about what Lucy's hand might have looked like. And so I've taken those two composite hands and brought them together into one. And this is what represents all the hand bones that we know, um, or the elements at least that we know of the hand of Australopithecus afarensis. And although these bones were originally described by Michael Bush in 1982, it was the incredible late Mary Marsky here of ASU and IHO that was the first to really describe and analyze the morphology from a functional perspective, to make infer inferences about what Lucy's dexterity and her potential tool use and tool making abilities might have been. And so Mary did this through comparative analyses um, to humans and other primates. And really the first question that you needed to answer then there was um, what is distinct about the human hand? What are the features of the human hand that allow us this dexterity that we can then, for, then, then look at the afarensis hand and try and find them? So, so compared to other mammals, as you may know from your own hands, we have really remarkable uh, dexterity and this ability this dexterity comes not only from our bigger brains, but also from the shapes of the bones in our hands. And in particular, humans are known for having, using precision grips, so bringing the pads of your thumb towards the pads of your, different, of your fingers, and doing this forcefully um, is a really important feature for human hands. And so when you think of using a pencil or throwing a baseball, for example. And so there are aspects of our hand skeleton that help facilitate this ability. And we can see these particularly in comparison to, for example, a chimpanzee. So one of them being our hand proportions. So we have relatively short fingers and a long thumb. Um, and our thumb is actually quite robust. And it has extra muscles, which makes it um, extra powerful compared to a chimpanzee, for example. We have really broad fingertips that help us to feel and manipulate uh, different objects. Um, we have a saddle joint at the bottom of our pinky finger, which allows more mobility um, and allows us to bring our fingers, our pinky finger over all the way over to our thumb. And we have reorientation of, of wrist bones as well as an extension of a, of a, a bone in the middle of our wrist um, called a styloid process that helps to sort of reinforce that area underneath our thumb and to accommodate the large forces that come from having such a powerful thumb during tool use. And so, Mary's study of the afarensis hand highlighted some of these human-like features in, um, in the afarensis hand. So first she noticed that it, did ha it had human-like hand proportions, so longer thumb relative to her fingers, um, and that there was some reorientation of those wrist bones that allowed greater mobility, particularly of our index finger. But she also noted that uh, Lucy was missing that saddle joint at the base of her pinky finger and she lacked that sort of reinforcement in the wrist that allowed um, her hand to accommodate these large forces during tool use. And she also noted that the fingers and the wrist showed that there was a really powerful flexor muscle so that she was still very, very, had a very powerful grasp. So bringing these mix of features uh, together, Mary concluded that Lucy, or, or afarensis in general, had greater dexterity than, than many other primates, but less than that of humans. And she suggested there were three key grips that Lucy could do. One being these pad to side grips, so that's squeezing your, th your thumb towards the side of your finger. Um, a th three digit grips, like when you're holding an apple or a baseball, and hook grips, and when you symmetrically sort of wrap your fingers around uh, a handle, for example. And we know now that, that gorillas and chimps, bonobos and orangutans are capable of these behaviors, but in 1983, we really only knew um, a lot about chimpanzee manipulative behaviors at this time. So Mary made some comparisons to chimps, and she said, well, we know that chimps can throw. And so she said that um, afarensis could have used 
uh, was, could also have used throwing for predation and, and display, and she used those three-digit grips maybe for better aim and velocity. That we um, also knew, of course, from Jane Goodall that um, chimps could fish for ants and termites, and that Alpharendus could have used her precision grips um, to do that really precisely, or hook grips for even digging um, for roots. And by 1981, we knew that chimps could also nut crack. Um, and so Mary Marsky decided, um, also suggested that Afarensis would use those three digit grips. And I'm going to actually quote her directly here for a reason um, that A. Afarensis was wielding hammer stones in preparation for vegetable foods and breaking of animal bones. And finally, that we noticed that when humans use stone tools, that they use those pad to side grips when they're cutting with stone flakes. And, there, and here again, she said um, that the Hadar hands were apparently capable of using this grip and to use flakes, and that using flakes for cutting, therefore, was probably within the Afarensis capabilities. And I'm quoting there directly, and, and, and Zariah already touched on this this morning, <laughs> but because fast forward 20 years later, and Zariah with, with Curtis um, and Shannon McFerrin showed exactly that evidence that Lucy or Afarensis was using stones to um, hammer or to percuss um, animal bones, likely to get at the marrow inside and using stone flakes um, to cut. So um, the late Mary Marsky was 20 years ahead of her, <laughs> ahead of her time. So in between uh, Mary Marsky's sort of first functional interpretation of the Afarensis hand and the cut marks um, that were um, described in 2010, there have been many, many other discoveries about, uh, that give us more information about Afarensis in general and the and our understanding of the, the early hominin hand and tool use. Um, we've seen some of these already uh, mentioned today. So there were some uh, beautiful metacarpals associated with an, uh, an almost uh, um, a relatively complete upper limb found in 1994 by Bill Kimball. There were um, the stone tools from Gona, which is right next to Hadar, were, were dated um, to 2.6 million years ago. So this made them, at the time, the oldest tools and getting at least a little bit closer to, to Lucy's time period. Um, there have been, of course, the amazing discoveries at Dakika and Wawanzo Mili that have, um, by Zarai and, and uh, Johannes, that have brought new information about growth and development and variation in body size in afarensis. And then in the new discoveries up until about 2015 that of relatively complete hominin hands that are associated to particular individuals and species um, that have given us more information about um, hand function and actually the diversity in hand morphology across early hominins. And of course, importantly, that we've heard about already the 2015, um, the announcement of even older stone tools at Lomakui in Kenya that are dated to 3.3 million years. And so this was a new type of technology. These are bigger tools. They're cruder, um, but they're big flakes, um, cores, and anvils. And so what was really important, I think, with this evidence here is that we finally now have this direct connection, at least in geological time, between afarensis and stone tool use, and particularly stone tool making. And although many people were already sort of thinking along these lines at the time, it, this was very clear evidence that stone tool making is not an exclusively human or homo, homo feature that Australopithecus or many other hominins at the time were also um, capable of using and making tools. And this conclusion is not um, so surprising now, and uh, especially given what we've learned about primate tool use um, over the last 20 years. So we have, um, we know that, that chimpanzees use wooden and stone hammers to, to crack nuts. And if we apply the same archaeological methods that we use at hominin sites to a chimpanzee site, we know that they've been doing this for over 4,000 years, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, we know that capuchin monkeys can wield hammer stones that are almost the same size as they are to crack nuts. Um, and when they do this, um, they unintentionally actually produce flakes that look a lot like old Dewan flakes that we find in the archaeological record. And they have also been doing this for at least 700 years. And long-tailed macaques in Thailand that show really incredible dexterity um, 
by using stones to precisely crack open oyster shells. And again, they also unintentionally produce flakes, old wand flakes, essentially. Um, so the more that we learn about the sort of dexterity and tool use in other primates, the more clear it is that, at least to me, that Afarensis and many hominins even before her time were using, um, were very good tool users. Okay, and so um, just to, to highlight that even though um, there's been a few more things that have been said about Afarensis' hand um, after Mary Marsky. Um, and so there has been some debate. Uh, there's been many that have argued about what her hand proportions might have been like. Were they, were they really quite human-like or what, did she have a slightly um, shorter thumb and longer fingers like we see um, in gorillas? And it's also uh, allowed people to think about what other reasons for why we might have human-like features in our hands, for example. Is it, maybe it's not about stone tool use, but it's about food gathering, food processing, grooming, or organic tool use. Or maybe that her short fingers are actually just related to her feet, <laughs> and that the, the need for shorter toes for bipedalism just happened to also create shorter fingers in her hands. Um, there's also been experimental studies done um, that show that when we use, when humans use stone tools and make stone tools, it, we incur a lot of high force on our thumbs. And, and many have said that, her, that Lucy's thumb is a little too gracile to have accommodated such, um, such high loading during tool use. And others that have looked at that that saddle joint of her pinky finger and said that, you know, she, she lacked the mobility to grasp these really big Lomenquian tools and, uh, and to use them um, with force. So there's still many, many unanswered questions, which is great because I still have a lot of work to do. Um, <laughs> so bringing this all, all, all together with the functional interpretations of Lucy's hand um, today with the increasingly older archaeological evidence that we keep seeing and what we've learned about dexterity and tool use in other primates, um, there's no doubt in my mind at least that Lucy was a very capable um, tool user and tool maker. Um, albeit per per perhaps not with the same force and precision that we can do today. But then when we take sort of Lucy's uh, hand in the context of her own skeleton and in the context of all the other associated hands that we have with, other, with, with um, relatively complete postcranial skeletons, um, I think it becomes very clear that various fossil hominins um, had sufficient dexterity to, to use tools, but were also still regularly using their hands um, for locomotion, which is not something I've touched on, but Carol just has, so which is great. <laughs> um, and so there's still a lot of work to be done in figuring out exactly how um, our hands were able to accommodate sort of both of those biological roles and doing it in very different ways, because each of these hominins looks very different. Um, and so to summarize the impact uh, I think that Lucy has had on our, is on our understanding of hand dexterity and tool use stems in large part because she was found before, um, our, before the sort of the, the oldest stone tools at the time. And that meant that um, her discovery sort of ignited novel investigations into what makes the human hand distinct and why. It meant it inspired alternative selective reasons for why an enhanced dexterity might evolve that is not just related to stone tools, and that it contributed ultimately to our acceptance that stone tool behaviors are not an exclusively human feature, and that many, many um, hominins and many primates are capable of doing that. Okay, um, so with that, thank you to um, Thank you to ASU and IHO for putting on this wonderful symposium and all, and in particular to the museums and curators and researchers that let me look at their fossils, because I can't do that when I, <laughs> I can't think about this without, without that. And, so, and thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm.